I would like to propose a podcast in which lesbians from all over the world can listen to lesbian affairs, and that can include anything from flannel shirts to cats, cat litter, cat sitters, hot cat sitters, lesbian affairs itself, um, politics, radical lesbians, veganism, non-veganism, anything. Welcome to a lesbian affair. Hello, hello, we're back for another episode, and I'm delighted to be joined by Pat, all the way from the United States. Pat, how are you? I'm doing very well today. How, how about we just start talking about how we found each other. We found each other through a community group. And in a sense, you have a very interesting story behind you. If you could just introduce yourself to the people that are listening to this, what, what's something you'd be willing to reveal? Um, we'll give you some of the basics and then you can ask me to expand where you like. Oh, I will. Uh, I was born and raised in College Station, Texas, uh, which is the home of Texas A&M University. And I'm the youngest of four. Uh, my mother, she taught at the university for 29 years. And um, my father worked for the local school district in charge of the maintenance and grounds for all of the schools. And so I grew up, uh, she was, she taught, she was the, my mom was the first female graduate student at uh, Texas a and in the uh, College of Health and Kinesiology. Wow. So it was a wonderful place to grow up, uh, literally on campus. And since she was in health and kinesiology, the, uh, all of the students who needed, uh, who were becoming PE teachers uh, would need, periodically they would need kids to help them learn how to teach kids um, before they would set them loose in a, in a classroom for their <laughs> student teaching. And so I grew up in, as a gym rat, really, um, surrounded by sports. And mom was also a big supporter of athletics. And so we grew up around all of the women's sports teams. In the, in the shadow of, of the academic world there, as well as uh, uh, used to be a military school. And so it has a very strong, it still has a very strong officer training corps for, for the U.S. military. Um, hmm. They commission more officers outside of the military academies than any other university. So I grew up listening to, we lived close enough to campus that we could hear the bands uh, every morning when they practiced in the winter, um, in the fall for football season and in the spring when they were um, try, sending out uh, or auditions for the new drum majors, and so there was that's it has a the military also has a very strong influence on uh, on who I am as a person. Uh, yeah, and I've actually had two different careers. <laughs> My first career, as I always tell people, I would I would taught health and PE and was an athletic trainer um, for a local high school, and then when I realized I didn't belong in the classroom, I had to figure out what I wanted to do, and. Uh, by then, because of age and some medical issues, I couldn't go into the military like I'd originally planned. And so uh, I went back to school and I became a park ranger. And so I worked for the National Park Service. And it has taken me really all over the United States because I put so much emphasis on my career. Personally, that was like one of the little side notes. Growing up, I uh, wasn't really interested in guys, but I wasn't really interested in girls either. It was more of, uh, you know, getting good grades. And I was a goody two-shoes nerd type person, but I was also a theater geek along with doing athletics, um, which I was kind of mediocre at all of it. <laughs> but I had fun and the experience and being able to have the skills of, you know, I know what it takes behind the scenes to put on a play. And I know the hard work that goes into athletics. So I don't really... You know, so I didn't, I, I am one of those, I guess, true definitions of late life lesbians. <laughs> I didn't come out until I was 45. And um, boy, you're not alone there. There's so many. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and looking back, I'm like, I should have seen the signs. But uh, even though mom was a health educator, it was, um, we didn't talk about it. And it wasn't, we didn't talk about it because it was taboo. It was just, didn't come up. Mm. Mom never pushed to, you know, say, hey, why don't you have a boyfriend or, or anything like that. Um, I knew that she was accepting because she was the uh, faculty advisor for the LGBT sco uh, student group on campus. And so that, it just wasn't something that was ever brought up. Uh, there's so much I, I already want to ask you there. You said that you had two careers and you realized that you didn't really have a or didn't want to continue or were not cut out for a career in teaching. I kind of stuck there because I thought, how do you know that? What what happened there? Because it, well, there were several things that that didn't suit me. Um, one was um, classroom management. Um, I don't understand when like a teacher says to do something, you do it. 
Um, and so I had students that didn't and trying to, Outrageous. F- <laughs> which, you know, it makes sense because I had friends that, you know, did the same thing, you know, it, te- you know, it was that whole rebellious stage. Cause I taught basically high school, um, grades nine through 12. Yeah, it, so the classroom management was something I just wasn't, ha- couldn't really get the knack of even. So there was the, the respect from students and also the respect from, from parents, when you're trying to do the right thing for their student, they automatically think the exact opposite of, you know, uh, without going into to details of some things. But I, you know, I had a parent say, you're picking on my kid because blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. Um, one instant, it was, instance, it was actually a, a, a health-related one um, where the student had possession of and had taken some pills that he should not have. Fortunately, the nurse was right. The school nurse was right there. And it's like, no, we're picking on your kid because they took this medicine and I'm more concerned about you wondering why you're not like taking your son to the hospital to get his stomach pump wow. um, kind of thing. Um, so it was those types of attitudes that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and a few other things that just were very off-putting in terms of being a successful teacher. I have a lot of respect for the teachers who are in for a long period of time and for, um, the teachers who make it look easy um, because it's not an easy profession yeah, by any stretch. I mean, there's, there's obviously differences across the world as in how education is structured, but the impression I'm getting from the U.S. is that it's a poorly paid job. It's mm-hmm. really hard to uh, get sort of the, the satisfaction from it that you could get if you, you had all the uh, means to do the job you want to do. So there's, there's a resource problem. Uh, teachers can't ever get fired, so there's a lot of shitty teachers as well, from what I've heard. Or is no, that actually is that they, they can true? get fired? Um, they can get fired. Um, there is the satisfaction, it kind of comes from even being able to do when you're able to make that connection with a kid, um, where it doesn't matter the resources because sometimes you can have all the resources in the world, mm-hmm. and if you don't have the skills as a teacher, um, it won't do any good. Because I had moments where you know, I didn't have a budget with, with some of the things that I was doing, but when you see that light bulb click and the kid gets it, like I remember one lesson we were uh, teaching bowling, uh, 10 pin bowling. Oh, that sounds fun. That sounds really cool. And, you know, keeping score in bowling, you know, I'm like, no, we're not going to, cause we actually had a field trip plan that we were going to go to the bowling alley. And I'm like, you won't be able to use the automatic score things. You have to, before you can, I let you do that. You got to prove to me that you can do it with the real math. And depending on, you know, a strike versus a spare, you, know, you got to carry over some numbers. And so, you know, the math teachers were loving me because we're, we're going over, yeah, this is how you use basic math in everyday life <laughs> kind of thing. And the best moment was during the field trip, one of the students who had been struggling early on in, the, in, the, in the, this unit called me over and said, miss, that score thing, it's wrong. And I said, well, show me. And it, and it was like, you know, bang on, you're right, it's wrong. And so, you know, those were the moments that just kind of are, are what teachers live for is when a kid shows that they've got it. Yeah. And it's in a situation that you don't necessarily have a plan. I still get the gut feeling that you would have been a pretty amazing teacher. But at the same time, what you're maybe also illustrating is that there is a sense of well, yeah, but it also impacted me and I need to watch out for myself. Yeah. The the stressors and the maybe inequalities and unfairness that sometimes seep through could have impacted you quite a bit. So it's, right, it's right. hat off for watching out for yourself there. Yeah, I was also the an, an assistant athletic trainer. So there were times that um, you know, I was putting in 70 hours a week between teaching and then um, being at the athletic events so that if, if a student athlete got hurt, uh, I'm the first person that, that would have been called upon for that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, like the first year I was, I taught for two years. The first year mom said, live at home. So you can, um, because I was teaching at a local, um, local school, she said, live at home. So that way you can save money before getting an apartment because just out of school, you know, you don't have, a, I didn't have a lot of financial resources Yeah, about midway through. I think it was at, at December. She's like, don't even bother getting an apartment because you would just be playing for paying for a place to sleep. And that's it. Cause that's all you're doing here. <laughs> oh boy. Um, and so, but fortunately it was within the next oh, nine months that I figured out, yeah, we were supposed to turn in our contracts and, you know, one of the office secretaries had figured out, I hadn't said anything. She's like, 
you can just hand it back in unsigned. It's okay. And I said, thank you. So it's, um, I don't really have a poker face. <laughs> so folks can figure out what's going on with me pretty quickly. And that was, that was one of the, the relief moments. Um, actually, it was one of the biggest reliefs while I was teaching was the day that I turned it back in unsigned. I wasn't going to be coming back. That takes strength, though, to, to do that, because I bet there would have been a sense of, I don't know, I, did it feel like there was a bit of fear attached to that? Because you're in a different type of territory once you could decide, um, that's not for me. Yeah, there, there was, because now it's okay. You've just spent six years of, on education. Uh, trying to, to become a teacher and um, now what <laughs> you're not going to be doing that uh, and I value security in terms of knowing what my job is going to be yeah you know, fortunately I had family to fall back on um, in that situation but it was not that next year was really rough trying to figure out okay so what do you really want to be when you grow up <laughs> stumbling across because I did some aptitude testing and such and somewhere in there park ranger came up and I'm a park ranger interpreter which means I my job is to help tell the story of whatever park I'm working at help people understand the context and the historical significance both good bad and in between mm. uh, you know to make people think so I'm able to use that education background and I don't have to worry about grading tests and discipline issues because if we have a school group and there's students who aren't behaving I get to give them back to their teacher um, kind of thing that must feel uh, relieving it is it must be like it you, is. come to come to the good side <laughs> yeah 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 I, I truly you know it's I, I consider myself one of the luckiest people because now I'm, I'm doing what my dream job is And we have people who say, oh, when I retire, I want to volunteer to work at the parks. And I'm like, and I get paid to do this. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I mean, that's that's a beautiful story in many ways, but there's still so many other points I, I kind of like was thinking I have questions about. So, I mean, the first question is your, your sexuality or your identity in terms of uh, maybe being queer or gay. Um, I'm not sure. We haven't really clarified the label. How, how would you? I am a lesbian. You're a lesbian. Me too. Yes. Awesome. And I will use that title. It, it's, it's grown on me. Um, and it had to grow on me because when I was in, um, in high school, I, was a, I mentioned earlier, I was a theater geek. And so um, I was a member of the International Thespian Society. <laughs> and so as a freshman, it was like drilled into me. You must be very careful how you say that word because people will think otherwise. And, you know, growing and so I was in school in the 90s. And so, again, that was not... Um, It wasn't something that was really talked about. Yeah. Um, either positive or negative. It just wasn't. You just had to be. So I guess it, there, it was a little bit of a taboo because it's, it, you had to be really careful how you said that word. Um, uh, well, it's funny because in my mother tongue, we don't have that issue. Uh, but then coming here, I did notice the, the close rhyming type of connection. Let's just call it that. And I always wondered why that is. And then I thought, well, it's, it's kind of true that a lot of gay people end up in theater. So maybe it was deliberate at one point and some straight oblivious person didn't notice. God knows. Well, Shakespeare did come up with the term drag. Yeah. There we so, go. I didn't know that actually. That's interesting. Yeah. It's in the stage directions. Um, let me see if I can remember it. It's dressed as a, and I, the, the G now, it, uh huh. Dressed, dressed as a as girl. girl. Just, yeah. Oh, wow. Because all of the all of the Shakespearean actors were male. Yeah, of course. And so when you had a female character, you know, they had to have dressed as a girl, drag for short. <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. Thank you, Pat. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> so hypothetically, where were you at when you were a teacher in terms of coming out? Because that in itself, even just the job itself could have been a great barrier to, to even wanting to oh, acknowledge that. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think subconsciously I might have like known something, but I just wasn't able to self-actualize it because I did have an instance where, well, I, I knew to be very careful with everything that I was doing because as a PE teacher and as an athletic trainer, you know, there's the locker rooms right next door. In direct contact with the kids. And well. you're in direct contact with kids. When somebody has an injury, you're actually touching the kids um, to make sure that You have to palpate different injuries to make sure, like if their fingers hurting or just medical assistance. Yeah, certain muscular, yeah, medical assistance. Certain certain injuries 
you know, a groin injury. Yeah. You know, you're getting close to very private parts. Mm. Um, and so that was something that I was always on high alert for. And I think, and that's only in certain situations. I remember uh, while I was a student trainer, I traveled with the women's soccer team to uh, San Francisco. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. We spent um, a whole week in San Francisco. We had a cup. We played University of Santa Clara and the University of San Francisco. And because they had rain, one of our sites was moved to a city park. And so we didn't have the same facilities that we would normally have, you know, some of the privacy. One of the athletes needed to have her groin wrapped uh, because she had a hip flexor issue. And it's like, where are we going to do this? And I'm like, all right, let's just go over. There was these big shrubs. I'm like, let's just go over into the bushes. And she's like, but I said, you've got your shorts on, number one. I said, number two, this is San Francisco. It's okay. <laughs> you know, that was, it, I know I was, I was half, jo- I was joking with her because, and you know, do I think it's really legal for something to happen in the bushes in San Francisco? I doubt it. <laughs> but at the same time, it was able, I was able to make a joke um, about it. And that was levity to that situation because she was a freshman. And by then this year, I was that year, I was a junior. So a year out of graduating. And so it was just, but I knew that, some of the stereotypes that go with athletes also, you know, as a PE teacher, I knew what the stereotypes of that were too. So I think I was really (laughs) heightened uh, heightened awareness of my behavior and knowing what was acceptable as a general rule in, in Texas and in the South. You know, I think that might've hindered some of my realization. You might've had a tough audience there. Oh, I I know I would have. I know I would have because just, I remember, we went to um, Colorado at, at the we were at the University of Colorado in um, Boulder, just outside of Denver, and there were two girls holding hands. And one of the uh, one of the basketball players was like, "Oh my God, they're holding hands!" And I'm like, "Shut up." <laughs> that was before you, know? you were out. <laughs> that's that's. Oh so yeah, cool. this was before I was out, and I'm just like, "It's okay," and we don't need to be yelling it across the gym. <laughs> You know, wow. um, so I was always, I knew I was always an ally growing up, not necessarily vocal, but very supportive, which is kind of uh, oxymoronish when I say it, but because uh, I did have a few, a couple of people come out to me and I was very, on, and I made sure they knew I was honored. So that meant that I could tell that one, I was a safe person to be around. Mm. And it was a big deal when somebody, because A&M is still a, a fairly conservative university. And so, you know, to have that trust. And someone uh, was a very big deal. I think it's a it's a great testament to to human virtues. And I, as you were saying, this the word of I was a great ally, knowing that you are gay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of this is funny to hear. And then I was just actually taken aback and was thinking, well, maybe we're just also a person with certain values because sometimes we use the word ally as if I wonder if it sometimes cheapens the whole thing because at the end of the day we all are human beings with values right and right. no matter if you're straight or gay or have certain disabilities or not I'm just just plucking a, sort of like identity fragments out of thin air mm-hmm. at the end of the day your actions say a great deal about who you are and I think in, in that moment providing this little pillar of security and having that sort of I oh, just stop shouting about that it's just a really nice and kind human action. And sometimes we just act, don't actually just point out that it's kindness. That's, that's just a really amazing virtue. It's, it's kindness and it's also respect. Yes, I agree. And, and the actions of showing that you respect someone else's beliefs and you respect who they are. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really the ultimate type of, of, of allyship in, in, in anything is showing that respect. Mm, yeah it's it's one of it's one of those core values and that that everybody demands but not everybody gives yeah i totally agree i think it's a hard one just accepting that we're all human sometimes i think it's a tough one yeah Yeah. oh gosh pat it's too easy to philosophize with you so okay (laughs) um san francisco aside it is true what you're saying about the stereotypes around pe teachers um being kind of wow Mm -hmm. Usually, particularly when it comes on the girls' side of things, not so much on the the boys' side, but girls, I remember crushing on PE teachers. Equally, it's it's, it's, it's an interesting one because what you also were illustrating there is the sort of tussle between conservative environments and the conflation of 
being a carer, being a teacher, being a, an educator, and how sexuality must not ever be kind of in the picture, even though in straight people's cases, it's always in the picture, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah, implicit yeah. when they bring home cookies, uh, bring bring cookies to school and say, my husband baked those. If that were ever to happen, that'd be amazing. <laughs> so yeah. it's that sort of thing. And then I guess also the tactile nature of PE lessons is because you, you would witness a really tender period that needs protecting, particularly in girls' lives, which is puberty. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I can see how that would have been a real bloody eggshell walk, quite frankly, if yeah. you had come yeah. out. But where were you with your awareness then? Was there any part of you that already had sort of an assumption that you could be or was it? No, 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 no absolutely no assumption. Um, it was just one of those that I think in my mind, I always wanted, I was like, okay, let's get settled career wise. And then we'll worry about the personal side. Um, it was like, yeah, it was, it was career first because, you know, then I could be financially on my own. I was, I could be independent, you know, all of those things that you want to be when you're a success to show that you're a successful adult. And so, yeah, I, I never even thought about it one way or the other. I do know that, yeah, no, wow. I just never really thought about it. Even, you know, when I moved up to Alaska, when I went to work for the, the U S forest service first, uh, to get my foot in the door with the, the U S government jobs, you know, I had an opportunity to for some of that realization uh, because there was there was a lesbian couple that also worked for the Forest Service and they were a great couple but one of them she was very outgoing and I mean she in the summer she had the, the, a crew cut and was just very assertive and self-confident and she scared me <laughs> because I am very much the introvert <laughs> wallflower kind of thing I like to watch and so to be around somebody yeah. that observant and um she even uh, came over to my my apartment to invite me to a party and she's like there'll be other lesbians there and I was just like uh uh not I mean, it was just I was so overwhelmed at that moment I was like I'm not a lesbian and and it was like looking back now I'm like oh my god if I had realized then or even just like mustered up the the introvert courage to just go out, then maybe I would have realized it 10 years earlier. And, you know, things would be so much different. Because the other thing is, since I came out, one of the things my mom has told me on multiple occasions is how much more self confident I am, <laughs> and outgoing, um, and willing, just, she said, there's just something about your, your overall self confidence that is very different wow. since you came out. You're not the first person to say this. In fact, probably even on this podcast, I've definitely heard that before. That's, that's an interesting one. What do you think that is that that has caused maybe more self-confidence ever since you've come out? I, I, I've kind of gotten, for me at least, it's more of a, I don't give a shit what anybody else thinks. Can I say that word? Yeah, you can. That's okay, fine. good. We, we're rated explicit because the word lesbian is in it. So. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's just not right. It's well, okay. Good. Then, then yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's not okay, but we might yeah. as well make use of it. Exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, no, I just, for me, it's it's uh, I've gotten to where you know this is it was it's like kind of on Maslow's hierarchy of that this is who I am, and even once I came out not only to myself but to others, you know, there's still sometimes a struggle of of letting myself, you know, letting the eyes wander every once in a while, <laughs> or or just you know enjoying what I'm seeing and, and experiencing life as who I am. I think you're, you're touching onto something there. I mean, some listeners might not be aware. Um, we're going to post a link. There's this famous psychologist who published an idea around how well-being can be measured and what well-being mm -hmm. exists um, in context with. And, and it's called the Maslowian pyramid of needs, hierarchical yes. pyramid of needs or something like that. And on, on the very top, so the smallest slice, it's similar to like a nutrition pyramid, <laughs> if is. you want to say it that way. So on top would be sweets and, and, and Maslow's well-being rank on top of that is self-actualization. At the very bottom is the idea of safety and physical basic needs being met, like drinking, eating, sleeping, that sort of thing. So self-actualization is a funny one because within that is a... Is, is I think an integration point of well, I am me and that's yeah. okay. I have choice, right? So right. maybe that's that's what kind of floods into that. this idea of coming out gives you more choices. Yeah, I, I think it does because there are no the constraints of trying to live a certain way. Yeah, that you have to have a boyfriend, that you have to get married and have kids. You know, all of the the heteronormative stuff. That yeah, you still okay. can. 
Yeah, we can. But just differently. I guess also the, the difference is like, like you said, you, you don't, when you realize you don't have to give a shit about what people think that you have your life to live. I think that that can be this real engine for, well, what next? Cool. Let's, let's figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it also takes out, um, I know it, at least at work with some folks, it has taken out some awkwardness because somebody will talk about dating or anything like that. And I'm like, eh, yeah, no, <laughs> um, not really happening on my part. Or you know, somebody posted, a, sent a meme and then apologized. It was, they had accomplished something. And so they sent a meme of, from one of the award shows. And somebody holding up a, I want to say it was like the Tonys or the Grand, no, the Grammys. Yeah. And it was a female, you know, how some of the, uh, the formal attire. Um, well, let's just say she was rather um, voluptuous and, and the, uh, the dress made her, her cleavage much larger as well. And so then it was, they apologized. And I looked at it and I said, why? What's wrong with this? <laughs> And all of a sudden they, they, they paused for a second and then they started laughing even harder because it's like, yeah, you wouldn't see a problem with that one. <laughs> oh boy. You know, it's so it's like that awkwardness is, is gone because it, it doesn't really matter. Although there, you know, there are some folks at work that it would, it would really matter to them. And so uh, again, that's where I'm very fortunate. And then I have a supervisor that's wonderful and I do have some, protections we all we all have and actually all of the federal employees have some protections when it comes to expression so i can put a uh, the pride flag up in my office and you know it's in my personal space so i'm okay so it's okay it's my personal space it is mm. um you know but and it also comes down to it wouldn't be appropriate to like have it anywhere else because the story that we tell has nothing doesn't have any LGBT stories that we know of. We talk about U.S. Marshals and the early Wild West type period, the late 1800s. Mm. Well, actually, pretty much the entire 1800s. Arkansas connects up to Oklahoma on the border, which is with Indian territory. So there's probably some LGBT stories. Was one of our deputy marshals? Mm. Yay, probably. But that's not something they talk about. So it's definitely not something that's going to be in any of our historical records. The closest thing is a rumor about a Boston marriage, which was slang for a lesbian couple or for somebody being gay. But that was also somebody who just visited the site. She was the daughter of a senator who wrote an article that was significant to our history. Yeah. And we don't know for sure, even the records, her records don't show whether she was a lesbian or not. So it's not something that we can even talk about here. So it wouldn't be appropriate to have the flag somewhere else um, within it, just to circle back to why I was talking about that. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I was, I was going to ask you about your uh, work as a park ranger, but in a sense, it's, it's an interesting one because you are also the, the mouthpiece of, of the history of parks, right? So right now you're in Arkansas. Uh, I just know that Arkansas is the place where Bill Clinton was governor. <laughs> so, so it's funny, people from abroad always have different associations with the place. I also know it's beautiful in terms of its nature, but yeah. also extremely rural, mm -hmm. farmers, that sort of thing I'm imagining in my head right now. Um, is that correct, roughly? And, and obviously Bibles and, and church and, and heavy sort of religious uh, culture. It is very heavy religious culture. Um, even though Clinton was elected governor, it is very conservative. How the hell did you do that? Uh, I was offered a job. It was for career advancement. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> awesome. Um, I was working in Alaska with the Forest Service. I wanted to be, you know, park ranger was my dream job. And all my family lives in Florida. My mom was like, okay, I'm tired of you being on the other side of the world. You need to move to the lower 48, <laughs> east of the Mississippi, preferably. So Fort Smith was the first place that offered me a job. And so... That's how I ended up here. It wasn't necessarily for the story. It was more for, for the career. I've been trying to move out since, but uh, because it, it is hard to, it, sometimes it's hard to move within the parks simply because if you got a good story, people stay on because they fall in love with the story in the area. Um, in terms of, we're not exactly rural. We are, um, Fort Smith is about 80,000 people. You know, you drive two miles and yeah, you're almost in the middle of nowhere very quickly. So rural is there and there's a very heavy Pentecostal religious groups in the area mm. that are difficult to, uh, to deal with sometimes in terms of just the hypocrisy of, and I'm using the air quotes and generalization of Christianness. Mm. 
um, because there are some churches that are are open and accepting as well. Um, I'm fortunate. I'm a member of one that is. That's good to hear. Wouldn't be otherwise, but uh, it, it's still something that's always there. And so therefore, finding others in this area hasn't been easy. And in a really oddball way, I've met more trans and gay men than I have lesbians. It's funny you should say that. It's it's often the case, actually. Also, even in, in London, where I'm living at the moment, you, you'd have more gay bars and at the moment or mixed gay bars than lesbian bars. Uh, so back to the story we're telling. So it's, it's, it, what struck me was quite interesting is that you essentially are becoming a historian of, of, of parks and you, you're calling it the story of the park, which is really metaphorical in itself. It's beautiful because it's just creating almost a personality. I'm imagining park personalities now. Oh, I'm going to steal that phrase. That's wonderful. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> Well, it's a living, breathing They being are. almost with, with lots of stories to tell. And one thing that I've done always since I was a child, and I still do, occasionally I look at the trees and I think, goodness me, you've witnessed so much. And then my really cynical side kind of like comes alive and thinks Hitler and Mozart looked at the same moon that I'm looking at right now. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, you know, depending on what mood I'm in. They did, but uh, some of them were able to draw positive inspiration from that moon. <laughs> Very true. Some might have not even looked at it and, and given it a second thought. Exactly. But um, in a sense, that's what's happening with parks. So I, I find it fascinating that you're essentially kind of going to work. This is what I'm imagining right now. You're putting your gay flag up and then you're educating, you're living the park story. You're reliving it. You're also researching it, which is why you know about these almost semi high class lesbians that were maybe transiting through the orbit of that park at some point. Yet, at the same time, you're a part of the story of the park because you're sitting there with your gay flag. So who's going to chronicle you as the park lesbian? You know, I, I don't think it'll actually be chronicled that way, to be honest. Um, That's a shame. It is. It is. But that does bring up a really good point of, of how the park stories don't stop with the end of what we're actually telling, that you know, the stories are also within the staff. Because, you know, I think as a lesbian, I'm more aware of, of injustices and since that is a big part of our story is the justice system. Mm -hmm. you know, being able to put a, a spin on and, and bring in some of the current judicial rulings. Um, that's part of how we make our story relevant as well. And so that I do rely on some of that and understanding of how the court system works and knowing that, yeah, this past summer, there was a ruling that said that we, we as members of the LGBT community are included some federal protections in terms of we can't be fired just because we're gay. Mm. And I, you know, it was one of those, I knew it was coming, but I didn't realize that I was, I'd been holding my breath until that ruling came out. It was all of a sudden, there was this brief moment of lightness in my chest. And to be able to bring some of that type of familiarity when I tell, talk about how the judicial system works and that we had appeals go all the way up to the Supreme Court. This is how it works. These are what's, what's going on now. Um, I have to pick and choose how I do that. Obviously, if they're wearing a magna hat, um, there are certain things that I'm not going to say. Mm. Um, so my is make America great again hat, which is associated again, with yeah. uh, Donald Trump in particular. Trump, that was, that's his logo. And, and that was, you know, one of the things that you could spot. And there were other clues in terms of, you know, if they're wearing a Confederate flag shirt, it's my heritage. Yeah, there's certain things I know to be a little bit more mindful of. Um, one of the things that's important to note, though, is that as when I'm in uniform and I'm working, um, this is also one of the more challenging ones is we are the mouthpiece for the parks. And so we're also then the mouthpiece for the government. And so our personal opinions about some policies or about policies in general, we can't talk about. So it's also a great thing to say that, you know, if, if somebody brings up a topic that's very sensitive, like politics or religion, it's like, um, I'm in uniform. I'm not, I'm, I can't talk about this. Um, I can't tell you what my personal opinion is. And they're like, it's just the two of us. I'm like, no, somebody could walk in and won't know that I said, okay, this is me talking outside of uniform. I'm in uniform. I can't talk about it. So I do get, you know, we do have a built-in buffer, mm. thankfully, sometimes for that. Well, um, I think I was just reflecting on, on, on that. And um, some people might've listened to me always talk about unity, but in a sense, I just realized that I actually am quite protective of this buffer that you just described for, for everybody, mm -hmm. because it feels like a unifier. Like think about MAGA heads, what you want to think. Um, I can see how for, for some people, uh, a set of stereotypes walking through the door. 
But then when you kind of yeah. like have a sense of, um, well, I'm wearing the uniform, let's talk parks. <laughs> let's not, yeah. don't mention politics. Um, I'm, I'm German, so I'm also very used to the phrase, don't mention the war. Um, there is a sense of, actually, there is maybe one thing that we can connect over here right now. And, and maybe there's a sense of humanity that can still come through, even though probably as a, a member of the public that, that might have different connotations with, with those hats, it must still be difficult to hold that. And I think it takes a great deal of personal restraint to be able to be neutral um, and to, to do that. But equally, the buffer might be protecting you too. So it's a interesting idea. It's an interesting idea. It, what I usually try to do um, is just come up with a, like a, an open-ended question that um, I don't really anticipate them answering. Um, that just my goal is to get them to think. Um, I'll give you an example. So we have two different jails that we talk about. And one of them is a, it was a basement jail that had 30 to 40 men in it with no cross ventilation no indoor plumbing. Of course, nobody back then had that, but still, they had to use a bucket in one of the fireplaces. Um, the conditions were just horrendous. One of the, uh, a reporter, the reporter I was talking about earlier, referred to it as medieval barbarity. And so we'll get people that come up and say, hey, we need to go back to that. And I'm just like, and they say it in such a way that it's like such confidence in, in wow. I'm like, really? So usually the question I ask is, like, have we ever arrested someone who's innocent? And wow. the jail is where they were held before their trial. Should they be treated that way? You know, you can just, my goal is just to see the gears start to turn. And so it's, it's bringing back some of the humanity and, and going, you know, you're making some assumptions, but let's check these assumptions. I admire that. That's a great way of, of, of framing that. And, and, and you're still coming from a point of curiosity because I'd be curious what the reasoning for that would be. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I'll ask, you know, okay, so why do you think that? And a lot of what I try to do more often, I've been able to, it's something I struggle with, but it's, it's trying to listen to understand what they're really mm -hmm. saying. What is, you know, when you say a certain phrase, that's really more of a stereotype. Why is it you're saying that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, explain to me. I'm not attacking what you, what who you are. I just want to know what you're saying. I think I, I admire that, and that's exactly how I approach these situations because I think there's still a bonding experience within that. If you can hold different opinions, explore it, and the best type of realization is always achieved when the the person themselves actually arrives at that point and and isn't in sort of like preached to, which is hard because it's very tempting to be preaching. My my 21 year old self was a great preacher. <laughs> And it also goes back to that thrill of discovery, um, that light bulb moment. Um, yeah, I can see teaching. that actually, yeah. <laughs> Again, that's why I feel like I'm in my dream job. Um, I do hope to go to one of the parks that does have more of an, L more of an LGBT story yeah. to tell. There's so many other places that, uh, that we have within the park service. Many of them are also in more urban areas that odds are have a better <laughs> LGBT community as well. <laughs> Or a more open one. We'll put it I can that way. I can see you kind of like in my in my inner mental sort of eye. I have this vision of you in front of a map with like some rainbow pins going into California. <laughs> Other places. Well, mind you, that's west of the Mississippi. That's not going to be happening. And that's all right. You know, if there's a, a good airport nearby, um, <laughs> you know. So like another one, like one of the parks I would love to work at would be like uh, Fort Vancouver because they actually have an airfield there. Hmm. Where's that? Which state would that be? That's in Oregon. It's right on the Washington, Oregon state border. Okay. Um, but they have an airfield and there's so many stories within aviation um, that are LGBT related. True. So that's one of those things. And I'm just like, you know, and aviation is also one of my favorite. It, I do have time for an avocation. I do volunteer work with the uh, Civil Air Patrol, which is the Air Force Auxiliary. That's so cool. You know, it's a cadet. Pro there's also a cadet program, and I'm the or I'm the wing, which is the state diversity officer. So I get to, and this is where I get to be a voice. Mm. When I was asked if I could be, if I would take the the reins of being the diversity officer to try to help increase the diversity within the wing and to help recognize the importance of diversity within. Um, the, the wing as well. And I'm also the, um, in charge of the cadet programs at my local school library. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and, and what was really neat from that was there were several people who reached out and um, there was one other lesbian in there who said, you know, her partner 
was worried about her being a member of this group because of it's it's military based and she's from one of the older she's from the uh, even the pre don't ask don't tell generation where if they found out you're a homosexual they would just kick you out period um, where actually where it was when it was illegal for homosexuals to be in the military period and then there was don't ask don't tell which wasn't much better because it still put the os on on the person to conceal themselves right you still had to be concealed but then just to go with that the next message that I put out was actually about the repealing of don't ask, don't tell, because it was an Air Force major who became the face of the ending of that because she made the Air Force prove that by being a lesbian was actually causing her unit to perform worse when they were actually able to prove that by removing her from her position, her unit's performance went down. And so they had no basis for um, getting rid of her. That's really clever to say, well, okay, I'm, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> Prove to me that my existence makes performance worse. <laughs> exactly. But that's what the base is. That's why they said that was the whole reason why gays were not allowed in the military. It's because your existence in there is causing upheaval within the unit. But they said that about women too, way back when, right? Before uh-huh. uh, yep. women were able to be in the military. It was sort of like, yeah, don't, don't have women in the military. They're going to distract all the, you know... Men mm-hmm. with their and that's the the same with combat roles and the same with serving on submarines, which women are now able to serve on submarines in the Navy. You know all of these things, and it's like no, it's you getting in in, in way of yourself, yeah, and really letting that lack of diversity is actually hindering performance because everybody is thinking the same. Yeah, no, no, it's it's, it's super interesting. So you. I'm just also struck by the fact because, I mean, you can always criticize these equality and diversity trainings. There's always something that can be done better. But I think sometimes we just don't stop and actually say, wow, within the means of community, how much impact do we have just even by our sheer existence? It doesn't necessarily matter what context it's in. And most of us will never be in the position where we have to write in an email to 500 people. I'm a lesbian or a member of the LGBT community. But um it's it's still an act of, of bravery in many ways. But I feel also like I'm yeah, missing something here because th- we jumped from you being a teacher, not out, to being very out. So how did you realize you were gay and how did you come out to yourself? Okay, that's actually a, a, a really interesting story. It, it's thanks to YouTube and a TV show called London's Burning. Wow. Okay, you know how when you, when you open up YouTube, random bits appear on the homepage, right? Well, one day, um, an episode of London's Burning popped up. And it was just like one of the first episodes. And I'm like, hmm, cool. Show about a fire station. So I started watching it. I ended up watching, this was at that time, and the person's channel who put it up is no longer there. But it, they had every episode in full length. Um, I think it's season 10. Uh, there was always a token female member in the fire brigade on, on every episode. Nice. And in season 10, Heather Peace joined. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, you know, I, I, I goof also around. I was like, huh, well, she's interesting. And so I also went to IMDb, the, the international movie database, to see what other shows she was in because I liked her acting and, and that. And so I started watching some of her other shows. Plot thickens. I have a feeling I know what's happening next. But do tell. I, I, sorry, I'm being... No, 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 no. Because you're right. Uh, as you... <laughs> My, my cheeks are starting to turn a little red with this one. Um, and lip service came up. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait just a minute. And, and so, yeah, there was that that moment then. And then, um, and even one of the, uh, like YouTube had one of the, um, at one point they did like character monologues. And Sam, who is played by Heather Peace. I'm, I'm just thinking, just to, sorry to cut in there. So just to explain, mm-hmm. Heather Peace is in lip service and she has a bit yeah. of a history of playing women in uniform, but in lip service, she for the yeah. first time plays a lesbian, I yes. think, and is a police officer, a detective. Yeah. She's Detective Sam Murray. There we go. So when, when uh, Pat says Sam, <laughs> that's who she means. Yeah, that's who I'm referencing is, is the character that, that Heather Peace played. Um, she had a, mo- uh, a character monologue. Um, every one of the lead characters, they did this as, I guess, like an extra for the DVDs. And I'm listening to it and I'm like, okay, that sounds incredibly familiar. 
just in terms of uh, some of the things she's saying. And so there's just like now there's this time for the self-reflection of looking back into my childhood of I was very much the tomboy, didn't really like boys, really even kissed a boy. Who was it that I was, and when I say attracted to, I don't mean it in terms of it was just more like gravitated towards were females in terms of in my church group. Those were the ones who I respected a lot. And those were the ones who I was, who I wanted to be around. And the people I wanted to be around were the people I wanted to be like. And then also looking at the television television shows that I watched, you know, they were the shows that had strong female characters. You know, in the seventies, you know, Charlie's Angels, Cagney and Lacey. <laughs> um, then later on, uh, China Beach with Dana Delaney and Mark Heldenberger. You know, and so and and you know, and I was more interested in the storylines that had where the female character was the, the key part of that storyline. And I'm thinking, okay. These should have been hints that you should have caught on to. And, and so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's because of London Fernie. And, and then I came out first to my, my twin sister, my older sister. At first I was thinking I was bi. And then my, my oldest sister and her ultimate wisdom asked me a question about guys. I'm like, no, they really don't do anything. She's like, you're not bi then. I'm like, okay. And then um, even though I knew my mom would be okay with it, I was still kind of anxious to tell her. And so I reached out to a family friend who um, had come out to mom when she was 18. Wow. Yeah, and she's just a couple of, she's in my, um, she's the same as my, my oldest sister, who's just a, a couple of years older than me. Um, and so I reached out to her and, you know, sent her a message. And she's like, she sent back and said, your mom will be cool. Just tell her, welcome to the club. I always wondered about you. Uh, that's and, so funny. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, but it was also very touching. And so I came out to mom and mom was like, okay, so what are your plans for this weekend? <laughs> it was this total non-event, um, which I give her a hard time about because I'm like, yeah, I was expecting like a little bit more of a response, but you know, at the same time, it's the perfect response for my mom. It's like, okay. Pat, I can't help but be jealous of that response. That's fantastic. I, I know. I'm sorry. I, I, I am. I, and I realized how completely fortunate I am to have um, the mom that I have. Um, I was never able to, come, I wasn't able to come out to my dad because he died mm, probably about 11 years ago now. Mm, um, even longer. No, we were lucky to have him. He had a long-term illness. We were lucky to have him as long as we did. Um, but thank you. The, the one little bit to go with that, and my sister knows, I, I said, now this is probably going to come up and you know I tell this story often. Um, so my twin sister, mom's like, so um, you got anything to tell me? And she's like, Nope, <laughs> not attracted to boobs. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> and so, so yeah, so that's a a pretty fun one because, and it's also you know interesting being identical twins to have one that's straight and one that's gay. I, I was just going to ask because I, as you said, what happened with your mom? I was like, oh my goodness! <laughs> I was just about to ask about your sister. So in a sense, it's, it's fertile ground to talk about because in a in a weird way, what's it like to be identical twins and to have people kind of like assume that you're going to have the same lives? Because I would assume then that you might have different gender expressions too, or there might be a lot of differences um, between you two. There are. And that's also one that, um, again, that's where I go back to giving credit to my mom uh, because she raised us very much to be individuals. Our names do not rhyme. That's good. For which I'm forever grateful for. <laughs> Growing up, uh, she told family members that if they were going to get us clothing, that if they were of the same design, because, you know, the 70s, there's really not a lot of options. <laughs> um, they had to, at a minimum, they had to at least be different colors. We, uh, when we were in athletics, uh, we were always on the same team because the juggling, you know, sending two kids to two different practices, not possible. But if we were in events that were individual events she wouldn't let us do ones where we would end up competing against each other so like in track and field um she threw the shot put in discus and even though i wanted to do that um because that would have us competing against each other then we uh, i couldn't so i did the triple jump instead because there was nobody else doing the triple jump for the team so they needed somebody just to have fill the slot kind of thing um i sucked at it <laughs> to say the least um, and then the other thing that was probably the most important when it came to treating us individually is every other year she got us our own birthday cake. So one year we would share a cake. The next year we had our own. And that goes back to an interview she heard 
about six weeks before we, we were born where uh, a twin was talking and he said he was 21 before he had his own birthday cut. And mom was bound and determined that wasn't going to happen to us. And so we were encouraged to express ourselves however we wanted. You know, we do have very similar. Um, we're, we both are tomboyish. Uh, we both have an affinity for short hair, but she works in the entertainment industry at, uh, at Disney. She's uh, a backstage tech, although she got to Disney by doing fireworks. Wow. So as a female in a male-dominated uh, arena, as a lighting technician or backstage technician. That's so cool. So, yeah, we definitely hit the cool factor anytime we tell people what we do. And it's like, I work for Disney. Cool. I work for the National Park Service. I'm a park ranger. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're not one for uh, spreadsheets and um, sort of like desk nine to five. No, no, not really. <laughs> Thankfully, although I am doing a fair bit. Uh, I am teleworking right now because of the devil bug. Yeah, <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that. That's, that's, that's such a interesting story. A I, I love that your yeah. mom asked that and that your sister was like, yep. nope, not into boobs. Yep. Um, can you can you humor me, Pat, for a minute? Mm -hmm. Can I get some embarrassing twin questions out of the way that you've probably heard hundreds of times? But maybe we can use this as an opportunity to kind of like get them out of the way for other people. So. Sure, go for it. Um, okay, so... Mm -hmm. Growing up, I knew twins. I was, I was kind of like really close with um, twins that went to the same school. And I'm so fascinated by what your mum did in terms of just making sure you're not in competition with each other. You have individuality. You even got your birthday cakes. There's a great deal of attunement that I'm sensing there. But indeed, I did pick up that the twins in my school were extremely competitive with each other. Um, so, but equally, sometimes it felt like they could read their minds, which was this, this strange dichotomy. Do you sometimes feel like you're you're doing things similarly or that you kind of have a connection that is difficult to explain to the outside world? Yes. Yes, there are times that um, uh, growing up we would finish each other's sentences <laughs> or um, mom would sometimes refer to it as uh, Pete and repeat <laughs> because she would hear one of us say something and then like 10 or 15 minutes later the other one would do it. And the scary thing is it still happens. Um, even though we live on opposite sides of the country, I'll call mom and tell her something. And then, you know, a few minutes later, you know, a day later, Amy will say the same thing to her. And she's like, Pat told me that a few days ago. <laughs> wow. And so, yeah. And we, we do, we are competitive with each other, but we do, um, we do sometimes have like our own means of communicating with each other that others don't necessarily understand. So how does that start? Is it like the way I'm envisaging communication that nobody else understands is, is probably something that's developed over decades. I'm assuming here it's probably like the um, exaggerated vers version of an everlasting conglomeration of insider jokes or not jokes, just insider knowledge. I know with some relationships I've had for a very long time, I just need to lift an eyebrow and they know what I mean. And that's because I've lifted that eyebrow before many times. <laughs> Is that the sort of thing? Exactly. It is. Or an understanding or type of patience that I have with her that I don't necessarily have with others um, in terms of if we're going to be doing something like we Zoom and text just about every day. You know, yeah. Thank goodness for technology like that. And you know, sometimes it's I'll open up the Zoom and I'll just look at her and say, OK, what's wrong? Or when she calls like the wow. first or like she'll call me on her way into work or on her way home from work. And just after two words, it's like, all right, what's up? And, you know, she doesn't need to say anything else. For a while, she also, mom said I was the, I was like a, a few months behind her, um, my twin, and, and starting to talk. And that was because I let her do all the talking for me kind of thing. You know. <laughs> well, that, that's so interesting. So I, I was just also reminded of, I mean, that's, that's a classical twin question. And, no, and I'm right. really sorry I'm asking this. I'm cringing as I'm asking it, but I'm terribly curious too. Did you ever swap? That's, that's a fantasy that, that people who don't have a twin obviously yeah. very much harbor. What, what would happen if I could just have my twin um, sit my exam? Did no. you ever do that? Uh, on a couple of, okay. uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, also growing up, Amy liked to have her hair shorter and I grew mine longer. That's so funny. Uh, which given now that mine is like really short, <laughs> um, I would have been much happier then. Um, but because we did try to be so much more individual from each other, that and I was always afraid of getting in trouble okay. uh, because I knew that if we were to try to do something like that, because there were people who, who couldn't tell us apart. 
even with the different hairstyles and such. I knew that if we tried to do something like that, that I would get in so much trouble oh. <laughs> that I was, and I was just like this great fear of, no, I was one of those kids who, who never, who I didn't even have to go have a detention at school. Um, I was that much not wanting to cross the yeah. line kind of thing. So. Well, you were a conscientious kid. I'm not going to fault that. That's not a bad thing. So there goes my fantasy of you sitting exams for each other. But if yeah. I ever find my twin, twin, yeah. if you're listening, I've got this exam deadline coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm going to make it up just specifically for this occasion because I There really want somebody else to do that. Now, no, the last thing that kind of came to my mind, and that's the end of my twin question barrage, is obviously you coming out as gay. And it's illustrated in your mom's question of, um, well, what about you? Yeah. twin sister is probably an event in which it, your individuality really got illustrated and it's, it's congruent with twin studies ironically around the idea of being gay because it's one of the things that has not been correlated with um, genes in that way so there are many mm -hmm. other twin identical twins that will usually most of them are straight but if there is one mm -hmm. gay twin the other one tends to be straight too or there's rare correlation between both of them being gay at the same time it does happen but not very often and not in scientifically significant ways let's just say it that way yeah. and it's, it's really funny me saying that because before we started talking i didn't know that you had a twin so it's not necessarily a question i thought of considering for this i guess what i was trying to illustrate is in that moment when you kind of came out to your sister and then to your mother there would have been a sense of this is a real difference between us mm -hmm. how has that impacted you to, to not have a connection in that sense where you share that too yeah that and there has been there have been a few uncomfortable moments or um, you know, I'll bring something up, like telling her about a celebrity that I like or, or something. Yeah. Had the piece. Yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> or, or, or some of the others, <laughs> or, um, I'll bring something up and, and I can just hear it kind of go, oh, I don't want to talk about it because you know, it's like, I'm not interested in this. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering, has that changed your relationship with your sister or has communication changed between you two compared to before? Overall, it hasn't changed that much, but it's more like in the details of how we communicate. And really, it's it's what we talk about more. You know, since she's not really interested in girls, there's certain conversations that we can't have. You know, if it's just something with a shared interest, we can talk for hours. And even if there's like overlap, she's like all for it in terms of like... Um, Like we'll talk about cricket all the time. We both have a, have a shared love for it. And she'll say, hey, did you see which players from the English team got engaged? I was like, oh, yeah, I did see that. Or um, you know, something along those lines. So where we have common interests, but where we don't, it gets kind of tough sometimes, like with books. Um, she'll say, hey, what? I need, I need a new book to read. And I'll go, oh, well, I just finished reading uh, whatever book it was. I said, but I don't think you'll like it very much because it's – a lesbian novel. And so the converse, you know, the whole subject matter, I mean, because I love like Kari Hunter is one of my favorite lesbian authors right now. Mm. And I'm like, Hey, I just finished reading this. And so we can't really talk about that very much. So it, it shifted a little bit, but not, uh, but it's just more about our interests than anything else. It's, a, it's an interesting one. because I, I think I know what you mean. When I um, came out, I started to become a little bit more active within the community and Uh, well, once a week I would be doing community stuff, mainly hanging out with other lesbians. I remember my mother from afar, because we are countries apart, would always kind of like say stuff like, oh, so what are you doing? And uh, she would notice that there was something quite regularly happening every week that was in an obscure sort of situation in a bookshop. And she just assumed that it was a book group, uh, which is an interesting stereotype. <laughs> and I've had the same with, with um, you know, bosses who noticed that I would leave her you know, work really hastily in order to get to my community meetups and, and just, just to hang out with the lesbians. And again, the word lesbian wasn't necessarily mentioned as much, even though she knew I was gay. But uh, sometimes she'd say, so what sort of stuff do you discuss? And I'd, I'd mention a couple of things that had been theorized upon. And, and it, it was really funny because every, yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever it would happen, she'd then say, oh, so what was the topic for you guys today? <laughs> Assuming that was just a, you know political debating group or something yeah. like that and it would be awkward to say well coming out <laughs> yeah i've brought up the community yeah and i've brought up the community conversations a few times and and it's just kind of like oh okay and then we Forget move on to you know whatever <laughs> else it is <laughs> that 
Yeah. Well, I mean, so, well, sometimes I'll say it and, and there is crickets in the background and then it's like, uh, so how was work today then? <laughs> or something like that. We'll just shift to, to a different subject. Yeah. But it's understandable in a sense, because we're living this, like we're, I mean, I'm attracted to women, you're attracted to women. So therefore I think I would have trouble relating to, um, the, the straight sort of like dating scene, if I had to think about straight dates all the time, it would be difficult. Yet, I think it's it's possible. I think gay people have done it for centuries. Um, I mean, gay people have played straight people in movies for centuries. So I think maybe we're more conditioned towards it. But at the end of the day, live and let live. And, you know, if it's somebody's preferred topic, great. But cricket is a great topic to be talking about, too, as long as you have stuff that still connects you, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we do. Um, we're big fans of fantasy football and uh uh, we support different teams in the uh, uh, in the EPL, so uh, so that also leads to some fun rivalry between us. And uh, um, so there's plenty of things that we and we talk just about every day about different things. Um, so it's it's not that it's hurt our relationship any. It's just there's like a topic that's difficult to talk about simply because of of lack of commonality. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, but I was just wondering. If you had heartbreak or if you had something challenging happen in your life, do you feel you could go to your sister? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if it comes to something like that, yeah, sure. If I had some relationship issue or something, she would definitely be there, an ear to chew on or or the, the virtual shoulder to cry on if I needed it. She may not understand everything completely, but it's still you know, our relationship is still there. And so, and the same is also true for her. If she had um, difficulty with the, with the relationship or even, um, you know, something to celebrate in a relationship, you know, we would both be there for each other for that. That's, that part hasn't changed and won't change. We've already, we've discussed that before. And it's like, no. And, and even my oldest sister said one day she would be, she'd be able to, she'd be there to dance at my wedding. So that's beautiful. Um, Although she would, being a minister, she might even be the one conducting it. <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah, your older sister is a minister. Um, that's that's wonderful, and I think it, it reminds us of the fact that we can sometimes be very critical with people and kind of like also say, "Why don't you understand me?" And there's a sense of, well, from my side, I, I certainly went, in my early twenties was frustrated when people didn't understand it right away. But at the end of the day, and I might have a bit of a centrist opinion there. It's it's beautiful when people just kind of connect over humanity and and when it counts are there for each other right no matter what creed or um sexuality or anything like that so yeah yeah i need to ask you uh the most important question of the podcast because we've been recording for almost two hours now so you know what's coming if you could have a lesbian affair with no consequences with somebody from past present history fiction tv (laughs) who would it be you know, I, I, I've thought about this question and it's one that I couldn't do a real person, you know, somebody living right now, simply because even though I know it's, it's no consequences, it's still not like anybody I can think of. They're already in a relationship and I don't want to do even think about <laughs> But No, I wouldn't want to mess anything up for them. So uh, there's a fiction character, Dr. Uh, McMillan from Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, Carrie Greenwood. Well, OK, I need so, to Google this. Hang on. Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries was written by, it's written by Carrie Greenwood and it's an Austra- she's Australian and they made it into a TV series. In the TV series, uh, Dr. McMillan plays a little bit of a larger role as uh, she is played by the, uh, as portrayed by the actress uh, Tammy McIntosh. It's set in the 1920s. She, in, in one of the episodes, um, Murder by Misadventure, Dr. Mac, I mean, you kind of had hintings of it before. But through the storyline, she is a gay character. And that would be the one. One, because I know she's single. And two, as a doctor and the conversations and, and just the char- her character, the character of this character is one that I would love to have conversations with as well. Wow. OK, so she's a doctor. And I've just Googled her. And she's got great taste in waistcoats. I have to say that from what I say. Oh, no kidding. The fashions they have her in in the show <laughs> are just <laughs> fabulous. And I don't use that word very oh, often. Pat, no, no, I think this is definitely justified. I will have to check that out. Thank you. I've never heard of that before. How have I not heard of this? I love historical characters anyway, but then if they're lesbian, yeah. hello, I'm there. That's great. Yeah. Now, Miss Fisher, I'll, I will say Miss Fisher is not queer. But the fact that there is a queer character in the show, that's not something that's made a big deal about. In the episode where you find out she is gay, it's also not, she's very much accepted. 
That's great. Um, as who she is. And so it's like, she's not, it, it, it's not made a big deal about it. It's the way that she's treated in the same way that all of the other characters are treated. She doesn't become a trope or anything like that. I'm also fascinated how when you justified your choice for um, Dr. Mac's character, you were very ethically on point. It's like, she's single. It would be legit. It's all fine. <laughs> Just like, great, great, Pat. Like you're, you're consistent you. throughout. <laughs> Definitely. That's a great quality. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And um, yeah, hope to have more, more chats with you soon. This was really cool. <laughs> yeah, I hope we do too. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.